Okay, everyone, I have with me uh, a guest, uh, Larry Johnson, uh, former CIA analyst, um, retired now, I presume. Are, are you, are you oh, now retired? I'm still semi-employed. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, not working very with the, I'm not working with the government. That... Right, okay. So it, it, is it, are you, uh, is it a private, you have a private company? Yeah, private, or... private consulting. We've done yeah. financial investigations throughout, uh, throughout the world, uh, money laundering cases. Mm -hmm. We worked on what one time on behalf of the European Union, we okay. brought a money laundering case against Philip Morris and the other tobacco companies for money laundering. That was we developed all the evidence of that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So Larry was very kind enough to um, accept my invitation for this uh, for this interview sort of a <coughs> discussion. Um, so we'll be focusing more on, on the sort of well what everyone's talking about at the moment, the, the war in Ukraine um and uh the wider conflicts that we're seeing as a result of that um so i guess i could go into the first question um it is are we going to see um some kind of ukraine counteroffensive? do you think that that's viable now or do you think that this is not not realistic i i really don't understand how they're going to be able to pull it off uh number one they do not have uh, air power, fixed wing aircraft, rotary wing aircraft uh, that can provide close air support and surveillance and other activities for, for troops. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the troops themselves are not well trained. These are, uh, in, in many cases, the people that have just been recently press ganged into service. Uh, so they, they, you know, barely know how to fire a rifle, much less uh, disassemble it, clean it, and then getting on to the more important matters like how to move within a particular unit and then how to interact with other units, how to do what's called combined arms, to be able to call in artillery strikes, to be able to communicate with uh, fixed wing aircraft overhead if there were such animals. Uh, so uh, they, they lack all of that. Uh, I think this is just going to be you know, a suicidal gesture. Uh, it'll be like the Japanese bonsai attack at the end of the Battle of Iwo Jima. They just jump out of the caves and go running into fields of fire without mm -hmm. being able to accomplish anything. They don't. They, they have yet to even establish that they can sustain a logistics support. Because if you you know think about it, that they're they're claiming they're going to launch a, a, an attack southward to cut off the Crimea Peninsula and make it all the way to the Sea of Azov, fine. Uh, you've got to have ways to fuel the tanks. They, they don't run on electricity or air. Uh, they're not green powered. So, uh, where, so where's, where are the trucks that are going to be following up? And all of this assumes... <clears throat> The Russia will be sitting back in horror, just going, oh, my goodness, what do we do? This is terrible. Uh, Russia has uh, extraordinary amounts of equipment, trained troops, fixed wing aircraft, rotary wing aircraft, overhead, uh, what they call ISR platforms from drones to satellites. So they're going to have some idea of where the blow is going to come, and they have taken and made extensive preparations in laying minefields, barbed wire, razor wire, dragon's teeth, which are concrete blocks that uh, look like a, a giant tooth that would be preventing tanks from uh, advancing. So uh, th this just seems like a suicidal mission of, a, of the, uh, just like the desperation of the Japanese at the end of World War II, this is, sort of Ukrainian desperation brought on by demands from the West that they launch a counteroffensive. And again, for the life of me, just from practical military doctrine, why in the name of God, if you're going to launch a counteroffensive, do you advertise it like an upcoming summer blockbuster movie? You know, Return of Superman, coming in July. <laughs> it's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, there's a... It, it, it would be funny, and we could ridicule it uh, to a large extent, 
if it didn't involve the fact that we're talking about tens of thousands of men, they're going to be slaughtered. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's not going to be Russians. It'll be Ukrainians. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's 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 very true. <clears throat> oh, very well, for um, for us in the West, I mean, certainly in America, where war is always something that happens far away. It's never I mean, when was the last time a war happened on American soil it was the Civil War? I mean, that's right. Right. 160 years ago. So it, it's just it's so far from reality for most people. They don't you know, it's it is like the movies. You know, we we, we joke about that, that. But then again, it's. Zelensky is an actor. It, it, for me, I, I, from what I see in politicians today, they're all actors. They're all just reading from a script. They're being told what they, 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 they have people above them telling them what to say, basically. I mean, would, would that be a fair assessment? Is that? Well, there's a lot of, a lot of manipulation in theater. Uh, the, uh, the one sort of group of politicians that do not do much political theater or acting are the Russians. They've been very candid about what they want, what they believe. And, you know, people say, oh, they don't really mean that. No, they actually, they're, you know, they're dead ass serious. Yeah. I mean, the politicians in the West, they're the ones that are just puppets, basically. Correct. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this, this, and this so called, this, you know, this anticipated Russian, uh, Russian, Ukrainian offensive, um, like you said, it, it, they don't have the the means to do it. It, it would be a suicidal banzai charge. Um, so so really, there. Even if they did finally launch it, um, then it, it there's no chance of success. If is that would that be a? I would say uh, unless the Russians commit suicide, uh, short of that, I just don't see. It, it would be one thing if Ukrainians had train manpower mm-hmm. and by that I, and I don't mean that they've just gone through a 10-week basic uh course because the military the the essence of a modern military is they're always training it's never it's not like you take a a 10-week course or then a 20-week course and at the end of that 20-week course okay you're done no mm-hmm. more training no every everything that the military does from the time uh, soldiers, Marines, airmen are brought in is they're either fighting or training, training to fight. So what you've had with Ukraine is their initial army that was up against uh, the Russians is essentially destroyed. Uh, yeah. The uh, As a result, they then, uh, the Ukrainians had to uh, scurry about and bring in new recruits. The problem they have is they don't have secure bases inside Ukraine where people can go and train without running the risk of being hit by a missile or uh, an aerial delivered bomb. Mm -hmm. Uh, Quite a contrast with the Russians. The Russians did a mobilization of 300,000 and uh, apparently garnered an additional 100,000 volunteers last September. Well, just do the math. You got September, October, November, December, January, February. So they're getting close to six months of full training. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about reserves that are going to actually be competent for knowing how to drive a tank, how to fire artillery rounds, how to coordinate that with uh, other units. the Russians really have shown a remarkable ability to do what is called combined arms, where frontline troops can be in direct contact with aerial platforms or artillery units or tanks and bring in additional fire on a particular target. Mm -hmm. Ukraine doesn't have that, and they don't have the kind of trained personnel that could do that. Um, The other issue is the day and age when... Uh, an army or military leaders could mass a force and hide it from the uh, opponents, that's gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the proliferation of advanced uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance platforms, ISR platforms, has made it impossible for either side to hide a significant number of troops. So uh, it's, just, uh, it, it's just a math problem of where is Ukraine going to magically produce these troops from? And then 
more importantly, once they get to a particular location, are they going to be able to sit there unmolested with Russia doing nothing? So, so far what we've seen, mm -hmm. Russia has stepped up its use of glide bombs uh, that are being delivered against concentrations of Ukrainian forces that were in theory, being prepared for this counteroffensive, so-called. So, the West is uh, heavily invested in lie. Uh, it is. I, I know for a fact that even the U.S. intelligence community continues to brief and present information that suggests that Ukraine has Russia on the on the ropes. That Russia is faltering. That Russia is running out of. Uh, munitions, the Russia's running out of artillery shells, Russia's running out of rock. It, it's, it's a psychological projection. Yeah. They are attributing to Russia everything that is a reality for Ukraine. Right. Uh, so uh, I, I just don't see how the West can sustain, you know, the, the talking two, three year timelines that this war will go on. Uh, I, I don't see that as at all as a realistic possibility simply from an economic standpoint. Uh, yeah. at, at the, the United States is already in the midst of a de-dollarization crisis. The price of the dollar is falling, which means for the United States, which is a heavily, uh, heavily dependent on imports, that means we're going to be paying more for imports because if they're priced with the dollar falling in value, that means to purchase the foreign currency that the other countries want to be paid in, mm -hmm. we're going to have to spend more dollars to get it. And so that ends up creating a real uh, significant inflationary effect. Right, right. So would you say the Ukraine <clears throat> army, um, the Ukrainian army is, is approaching being a spent force? I mean, how, how much longer can they can they go? And more importantly, how much longer can, can the United States and NATO prop up the Ukraine army? Well, that look at, let's first look at the narrative that the West has spun. The, narr the Western narrative is that the Ukrainians have launched counterattack after counterattack. They drove the Russians out of Kiev. Uh, they drove the Russians out of Kharkov. And they drove the Russians out of Kyrgyzstan. I mean, ma magnificent military advances, unstoppable military force. That's pure crap, just utter nonsense. Yeah. The, uh, the Ukrainians did not do anything on the ground that compelled the Russians to uh, withdraw from Kiev a year ago. Because, you know, we, we had photos, we had reports that... Uh, there was a column of Russian tanks and vehicles that stretched anywhere from 24 to 40 miles in length. So you got to ask yourself, well, why didn't Ukraine destroy it? Because that column was a sitting duck. They didn't. Yeah, Russia suffered a few uh, losses in armored vehicles and, tra and trucks, but it was no nothing massive, nothing extensive. Mm -hmm. uh, evidence suggests that that was a feint. Uh, it probably had two purposes. The Russians wanted to see if Kiev would, you know, consider surrendering. They didn't. And so then they used that that size of force to fix Ukrainian units around northern Kiev in order for uh, Russia to be able to move its forces south, which they did, mm -hmm. and uh, stepped up the attacks in the Donetsk uh, republics, and Luhan Donetsk and Luhansk and the Donbass. And, and then went into Mariupol. We have not had a single example where Ukrainian forces have moved forward under fire from a Russian unit that is comparable or maybe slightly less in number, but still armed and capable of fighting back. Uh, what took place in Kharkov was the, the, the Russians had border police, basically. So they did not have established military units that were capable of fighting back, and they did a they did a tactical withdrawal from the unit from the area. People want to call it they retreated, you know, call it that makes you feel good. Great. Uh, the same happened in Kherson. Uh, General Surovikin looked at the situation and recognized he would have a real supply problem because of the potential of flooding the river, 
and preventing the, the Russian soldiers from getting across. And he didn't want them to be you know, stuck in the way that the army of von Paulus was stuck uh, at the around Stalingrad towards uh, December uh, of uh, 1940, 42. So. Uh, he withdrew, withdrew them across. Again, they were not under fire that inflicted significant casualties on Ukraine. So we don't have a single instance in which Ukraine has launched a concentrated attack mm -hmm. against defended Russian positions that are armed and equipped with artillery and other obstacles and driven them back. Yeah. We do, however, have example after example of Russia doing that to Ukraine. Mariupol was the first major city to fall. But we saw it with um, the latest one was Solidar, and the one that's ongoing is Bakhmut. In both cases, the, the Ukrainians are well entrenched. They've been supported with artillery, and still they can't stop the Russians. Now, yeah. the West wants to criticize Russia. Oh, they're not moving fast enough. Well, uh, God didn't set a timeline on this, and this is not like a, a sports competition where you know the the soccer the soccer match is underway, and we're now at the ninety minute mark, and therefore it's going to be called any time now. Please. Yeah, 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 yeah. So from from what it appears is the Russians are more interested in destroying the Ukrainian army rather than making quick advances because once the Ukrainian army has nothing left to fight with, then recapturing <clears> territory <throat> is, is just a case of moving from point A to point B and, and, and you, that's it. You're occupying it. You can't, you can't, you can't occupy territory if you don't have an army. So I, is what I'll yeah. be right in saying that's, that's what the Russians are doing. They're just slowly grinding away at the Ukrainian forces until they they collapse. And, do you think that we'll see a sudden collapse and they'll they'll just collapse like very quickly like we saw in in 1918 with the the german army yeah. just after it launched its final offensive and then it just ran out of steam the americans arrived and that was it is are we gonna are we gonna see something like that or yeah no, I, I i yes I, I i don't see how ukraine can sustain this even with continued uh Un unrestrained support from the United States and the rest of Europe. Uh, I think what we're going to start seeing is cutbacks both by Washington and by the rest of NATO in terms of the support that can be directed uh, to Ukraine. And once that money starts drying up, the game is up. The, 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 the Ukraine has been kept alive on life support. It's like someone who's on a ventilator yeah. Uh, that, that oxygen line running is the financial resources that have just been pouring out of the West um, in, into Ukraine and into Kiev at, at levels of corruption. A lot of it's being stolen and diverted to property and retirement plans for uh, near senior officials. Uh, yeah. So, excuse me here, I got to shut off my phone here. Um, so this is... Um, I, I don't don't see the combination of being able to sustain an army in the field with the logistic support that they need, and at some point, uh, you know, it's going to break. Uh, they are not uh, we're not seeing the signs of well trained troops showing up with well grade equipment and with you know the only thing the Ukrainians have going for them is some of their military leaders like uh, Skirsky and Zaluzhny are, you know, they're, they're, they're sound, sound leaders. They're, they're not incompetence. Yeah. But uh, just because you've got good leadership doesn't mean that you can magically produce the uh, logistics needs that the army has in order to operate in the field. Yeah. Is it like, do you think that it's, it's possible there could be a, a coup whereby the military, the Ukraine military, they see the writings on the wall and they they realize that this is completely futile so they move in and remove the government the, the Zelensky regime and install a military junta temporarily until they can negotiate with the russians and bring some kind of 
negotiated settlement. Is that a possibility? Well, yeah, it certainly has to be considered a possibility. I, look, when when you're trying to lay out what are the what what possible outcomes could we see? The least likely outcome is that Ukraine somehow defeats Russia, and a defeat in this case would mean forces Russia to abandon the territories that Russia has incorporated into the Russian Federation by vote and abandon Crimea. Uh, that any of that would happen, zero percent. Uh, for that to happen, it would mean the, the, the you know, potential end of Russia itself, and that would be the ultimate existential threat. And, and I don't see the Russians laying down and, and going, you know, submitting to that. So set that aside. That's that's on the table as could happen, but not at all likely to happen. Um, a negotiated settlement where uh, Z Zelensky finally comes to grips with reality and says, OK, um, uh, we can't continue this fight. We're going to cut a deal with the Russians. Yeah, he could. He could possibly do that and stay in power, though I think it's unlikely. Um, he is, uh, if, if the reports that Cy Hirsch has put out are true, that he, uh, Zelensky was warned by the CIA director, Bill Burns, to stop uh, you know, hogging all the, uh, the theft, that he was, he, was one of the, he was one of the biggest thieves, um, that that was, uh, you know, that could can make him a popular person. So um, I, I think the most likely outcome is as the as the military collapses, either Zelensky will flee the, for someplace in exile and try to set up a government in exile, or uh, as you outlined, possibility of an internal coup to get rid of him and then cut a deal with the Russians to save what's left of Ukraine. Right. Okay, and um, Finland joining NATO is—is is that what? What are the implications of, of of Finland becoming a member of NATO? Uh, what are the implications for Russia and the the greater geopolitical um, situation? Uh, it, it's a stupid move on the part of Finland. Uh, you know, Russia is not at all concerned about a Finnish invasion from the north. This is not 1940, 1941. Um, this is this is more, uh, if you will, another sign of the desperation. NATO. They keep having to add members. Why? Well, because they don't have enough forces in NATO. Really, I think the largest, uh, apart from the United States, after the United States, the the uh, country that provides the most soldiers, they're actually capable of fighting and deploying, is Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, the United Kingdom has 73,000 strong, you know, so-called strong. Well, hell, that wouldn't that wouldn't fill the University of Alabama football stadium. <laughs> that football stadium holds over 100,000. Yeah. So you could put the entire British Army in one football stadium and still have, uh, you know, a third of the seats open. So the United Kingdom needs to wake wake up out of its drug-induced uh, delusion. That it's somehow a credible military force. It's not. It's a joke. Yeah. Ditto for Germany. So, uh, you know, the Fens, great. They get to play NATO. They get to dress up and play soldier. But, but again, they don't have a significant army at all either. So it's just, it, it, it's, it, it's a, from my view, a meaningless political and military gesture. You know, it, it's Russian. Russian authorities will have to take take that into account from a planning standpoint mm -hmm. and having to prepare possible uh, defensive measures. But again, you, Finland offers no credible military threat to Russia or to anybody else for that matter. Yeah, I mean, it's a population of, I believe, like five million people. So yeah. I mean, they, they, I, they may have a, a small, you know, a well-trained army, but it's going to be a very s small army at that i don't think they have the numbers i mean they wouldn't dream of launching an invasion of russia i mean that would just be completely suicidal i mean i, I guess right. with the ukraine the western powers um ukraine had a has a big population so they were able to draw from that and create this this uh this army 
that is fighting against the Russians. I mean, I the, the way I see it, the, the Ukraine army is is basically a de facto NATO army that is the best NATO has. I mean, would you say that that they really are throwing yeah, their best look, foot forward? Yeah, it, go back and look over the last nine years now. In the aftermath of the uh, uh, uprising in Maidan, the coup, the U.S. backed, the U.K. U.S. backed coup in Maidan, <clears throat> um, NATO and U- U.S. Uh, European Command, U.S. Ar- U.S. military's European Command, uh, conducted annual exercises, military exercises, in or on the borders of Ukraine. Uh, you know, you can go online. At least you used to be able to. You could see video of U.S. Marines and landing craft landing on the shores of, of, of uh, southern Russia or southern Ukraine. And all of these were presented as you know, defensive exercises. Well, last time I checked, whenever U.S. Marines are coming off of a landing craft, it's not defense, it's offense. So um, to that extent, yes, Ukraine has received uh, extensive training support over the years, and probably uh, in terms of actual manpower at the start of this special military operation by Russia, actually fielded the largest army in Europe by any country, uh, yeah. is larger than France, larger than Germany. Uh, in fact, it was I think it was larger than France, Germany, uh, combined uh, and the UK combined. Yeah. So. No, yeah, and that and that army's been decimated. They've had to uh, go out and do some uh, dramatic recruiting, where they're tackling people in the streets and forcing them into vehicles. Yeah, so I just again, I uh, I understand people's need to try to put spin, put the gloss on a terrible situation, but yeah. there does need to be some you know realistic, clear-eyed thinking about what's going on. That. Uh, they they have no credible military foundation for defeating Russia because uh, Russia Russia has not even begun to deploy the bulk of its resources both in terms of man manpower and advanced weaponry uh, yeah. that's that's another sort of intelligence failure on the part of the West yeah 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 it it, it makes me wonder why. I mean, the Ukrainian soldiers, I know a lot of them are, are, especially now, they're forced into this. They don't, you know, like you said, they're being kidnapped off the streets. And I've seen videos of this. It's not, you know, these aren't rumors. These are true. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can see it. And so what, what is motivating the, the Ukrainians now? Do they really think they can defeat Russia? I mean, is is this, are they that conditioned? Do they hate Russia that much? I know there's animosity, but I know they've been conditioned, but is there that much are they that deluded? What's what? Yeah, there there are some elements within Ukrainian society that uh, you know go back. They have not let go of the memories of the past, yeah. uh, where the the blame directed at Russia, which at the time was the Soviet Union and Joseph Stalin, and both what was perceived and 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 was in fact the persecution of the Catholic Church in what now uh, constitutes Western Ukraine. So you have this uh, religious division, which really has divided Ukraine since its foundation, of Mm -hmm. those that uh, are are adherents to the Roman Catholic faith, and then those that are followers of the Eastern Orthodox Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this, this battle between these two uh, religious organizations goes back a thousand years. You know, it's, it's not, it's n- nothing new, mm-hmm. uh, or almost a thousand years. But so you've got that. Uh, what, what, what I find fascinating is the vitriol directed against Russia is accompanied by a blindness with respect to Poland. Now, when uh, Stefan Bandera, he, he slaughtered a bunch of Poles. I mean, hundreds of thousands of Poles, him and his organization. Yeah. And yet, for some reason, Poland has developed a fondness uh, for the descendants of Bandera. 
that you know currently uh, are in control of the government in Ukraine. So it just, you know, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, this is the, this. It is it is a genuine hatred. Um, I think Russia actually early on thought that they could be some foundation, some basis for reconciliation. But this this neo-Nazi element that is dominant within the current government, the Zelensky government, it, it's 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 evil. It's uh, it's malevolent. And it needs to be uh, it needs to be eradicated. That's where the where the Russians are talking about denazification. They're, yeah. they're not they're not exaggerating. They're not just making uh, a, a, a political statement. They're yeah. describing what actually needs to take place. Yeah, yeah, and they're doing just that. I mean, I I don't think they're going to stop until that's that's achieved. Um, and. I mean, I've I've asked. I'm sure I've asked Scott Ritter this before, and I think other people have seen it. But as time goes on, the same question <clears throat> at again, um, and that would be: Do you think Russia will occupy? Do you think they're once they've once the Ukrainian army collapses, are they going to move all the way to the Polish border, or will they stop at Kiev, the Dnieper River? I really don't know. Um... I know I'm pretty sure that on the one hand, they don't want to get into the position of being an occupying force. Yeah. Um, so one solution to that is to find uh, local Ukrainian units that are not poisoned by the Nazi past and, and that therefore they can be given the job of pacifying the territory. In fact, like local militias that will be in charge of their local areas. Yeah. Uh, I could see something like that developing. Um, Russia wants to make sure that there is not going to be a military force building up on its borders. What they're seeing right now is, the, for example, the United States has deployed both the 82nd and the 101st Airborne uh, regiments that are once in Romania, once in Poland. Now, they have no military purpose other than to threaten Russia, that, you know, they're not there for a de defense. Russia is not planning an inv a wider invasion, mm -hmm. which is one of the lies that's being sold to the American people. I, I, I find it is just laughable that yeah. the, the image in the, in the American media is that, oh, Russia and China, these are imperial powers bent on conquering the world. And then you tell people, you say, okay, since 1990, how many countries has Russia invaded where they've sent military force against the will of the local people? Well, you could argue uh, you, the current war in Ukraine, what happened in Georgia in 2008 was a consequence of Georgian elements attacking Russia. So it was uh, entirely a legitimate military response. Other than that, Russia has sent troops to Syria at the invitation of the government of Syria. Yeah. In contrast, uh, do the same for China. China hasn't invaded a country since 1979. That was Vietnam. And it, lo it lost that war because uh, Vietnam had been attacking Cambodia, and that's why China intervened then. Well, what about the United States? Get out a long piece of paper with it, because you're going to be writing lots of names. Uh, from 1990, you know, you, we've got uh, Panama. We've got Iraq. Twice. Twice. You've got Afghanistan. You've got Syria. We've got Somalia. We've got Yemen. we got the, uh, the former Yugoslavian Republic, uh, the war in Bosnia. Uh, so, you know, the United States is the aggressor. I mean, that's it's just an objective fact. Yeah. And in the United States, we like to pretend that we're out there fighting for freedom and democracy. And it's just it's it's a it's a lie. I think. The, the, a major motivation or driving factor driving this militarization is the need to, you've got to have an external el enemy, a villain of some sort, yeah. in order to justify the size of the military industrial complex, which continues to grow and expand. It doesn't matter what happens. And I, I've always used the skit from Saturday Night Live with Christopher Walken, uh, the, where they uh, were do, did a skit about the Blue Oyster Cult, the band, and every 
every uh, 30 seconds, Walken comes out and says, more cowbell. We need more cowbell. And, and that's the U.S. response. We need more cowbell. We need more defense spending. Yeah. We, got, uh, we keep hearing that you know, the United States has got the, the, the most sophisticated, most advanced, the bestest, swellest military in the world. It's got the most expensive, and I've characterized it at one point as it's got we got like a Lamborghini with no tires. Right. Uh, it looks great, but its capability to to do certain things is quite limited, and is now running up against recruiting shortages, uh, very expensive uh, combat systems that uh, are not reliable and that break down. So. And the technology has completely altered the mm-hmm. strategic picture for the United States. So, yeah, you know, we're 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 at a what what we're you're living through a period that historians will look back at yeah. as uh, consequential. It's as it's it's as consequential as what happened at the end of World War II in terms of creating a new world order. Yeah. We're in the process of seeing the creation of a new world order where the United States is no longer in charge. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and it's lashing out desperately to try and cling on to its position <clears throat> as, as global hegemon. But it just seems that they no longer have the, the, the pragmatic and, and very um, intelligent people that used to run. At least they, they had they had some sense and they weren't, weren't quite so reckless as the ones we have now. They just seem to have lost yeah. touch with reality. I mean, is it because they, they're, they're kind of drunk on, on, on success of what they've inherited? Basically they haven't really, what was, what the U S has now what is, was, was built on is not the people who are in charge now didn't create this. They were, they, they essentially inherited the position of what the U.S. has, so maintaining it is a little <clears throat> bit more. I guess, yeah, I guess they've lost that that pragmatism. Would that would that be? Well, it, it, people, you got to look at the experience, what they came out of. So, uh, for when I was at State Department in 1990, mm-hmm. uh, the National Security Advisor to then President George H. W. Bush was a gentleman named Brent Scowcroft. So Brent was a man who had experienced World War II. Mm -hmm. Uh, He lived through the Korean War and the debacle in Vietnam. So he had a good understanding of the risks that were inherent uh, with uh, dealing with a nuclear-powered Russia and a nuclear, uh, nuclear power like China. So there was, there was some caution and some wisdom based on experience. Mm-hmm. The current crew you've got, they've had, the United States has been involved with several military operations overseas expeditions where we're, we're basically beating up on the kids in wheelchairs. We're like the school bully. We'll yeah. walk around the kids that are uh, crippled and incapable of defending themselves. That's who we're beating up. And then we think that we're a mighty military power. And so that has sort of gone to their head that we can get away with telling others what to do because we've been acting with impunity. Yeah. But it, it's a lie because now we're up against Russia, who is a peer military power and has, in fact, several advantages and superior uh, weapon systems to that of the United States, certainly has a more robust electronic warfare capability. Uh, has developed functional uh, uh, hypersonic missiles like the Kinsal. Uh, and the United States is so jealous of it, we did try to minimize, oh, the Russians really haven't done anything that significant. Uh, the United States can't do it. The, uh, Russia has. Uh, so this complete disconnect from reality, we got th- these guys, Blinken, Sullivan, they're children. Yeah. They're they're. they're complete incompetence, which appears to be one of the things that has awakened, at least according to Cy Hirsch, some elements in both the U.S. military and in the U.S. intelligence community, uh, opposite opponents, people willing to leak information, people willing to expose some of the stupidity, Mm -hmm. because they recognize 
that this current leadership team around Biden is on a road. Uh, it's catastrophic. Yeah. But they're what they're t- taking the United States into. Yeah, because they they're, they're <clears throat> fighting this, this di- disaster in, in Ukraine and they want to take on China and they want to take on Iran as well. I mean, <laughs> it's like, what is wrong? With, I mean, are they... <laughs> Yeah. It just shows the the level of 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 madness of these people. I mean, do they really think any of this is going to lead? Are they going to come out victorious with that? I mean, it's just the least. If they're going to take on Russia, don't take them. Don't take Russia on on Russia's doorstep. At least take them on on your own terms. Like being a naval power that the U.S. is. At least dr- try and bring draw the Russians out to some naval battles. Some somewhere away from the Russian doorstep like ukraine it's it just seems the whole idea just seems ludicrous because yeah, no. Russia is a land power and america is not really yeah. a land power it's a it's a naval power um yes they're utilizing the ukraine um i always say like a battering ram to try and smash the door down in, in russia's front door but it just it's it's disintegrating at their door because the door is a lot harder than they, <laughs> than they anticipated and it's backfiring right well, the, the United States, uh, its its era as a naval power is coming to an end as well. Right. And that's coming to an end because of the hypersonic missiles that Russia has developed and is going to share with China, yeah. which means that you can't put a carrier battle group any within 2,000 miles of China's coast wow. without running the risk that they will be sunk because the U.S. Uh, air defense system for those uh, naval ships is non-existent. It, it cannot stop the hypersonic missiles. Yeah. So at this point, the United States has a completely vulnerable system that uh, will not be able to withstand the, the attacks that will be launched at it. Mm-hmm. So that's you know that's part of what we're seeing here is transpiring, and the United States is having trouble coming to grips with that. Yeah, uh, we keep indulging this fantasy about yeah we. We took on the sheep herders and goat herders in Afghanistan and Iraq, and we weren't able to beat them either. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not like they were operating artillery systems with fixed wing aircraft and had, you know, uh, armies, fixed armies. You know, these were guerrilla fighters that we were yeah. incapable of containing and stopping. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like in Vietnam. I mean, that was an unconventional war, and it was <clears> mostly. <throat> Yeah, it was mostly a guerrilla, a guerrilla war, and the U.S. That I think that's that's one of the reasons the U.S. failed um, in that war was because they they were trying to fight a an unconventional war, conventionally, and that that was. Well, it was, it wasn't it wasn't purely a guerrilla. The let's call it the the North Vietnamese fielded armies, you know, divisions. I mean, they. Right significant number of troops and then there's that organized army that ultimately completely quashed uh the south vietnamese forces that were left but it was it was a reminder that uh, a conventional army of foreigners who don't speak the language who don't understand the culture uh, are inevitably not going to be able to quell an insurgency short of a complete scorched earth policy Right. Now, I know that one of the one of the fantasies that's being espoused in the West is that uh, they will unleash an Afghan style uh, guerrilla war on the Russians if they dare to come into and stay in Ukraine. Well, again, what these people are failing to appreciate is when when the Brits or the Americans or the Germans or, you know, name your foreign country that goes into Afghanistan. They are not part of the local culture. They don't speak Pashto. They, you know, they don't speak the various languages. They're not, they're not part of the various cultures and tribes. And they certainly don't, you know, they stick out like a, a sore thumb if they yeah. come into a particular community. Well, Russia doesn't have that problem in Ukraine. Yes. Line up a Ukrainian next to a Russian and tell me the physically how you spot one from the other. You don't. And the same with language. A lot of Ukrainians are emphasizing, oh, we want you to speak Ukrainian. But even like Zelensky, 
he, he grew up speaking Russian. He has terrible Ukrainian accent. Uh, and I've, I've been very amused by uh, all the, 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 the Western media types that have been trying to show their sophistication with respect to the war in Kiev. They keep talking about Kiev. Yeah, I've noticed that. And well, Kharkiv and... and okay, the, and yeah. you, you know, why is it pronounced Kiev? Do you know? I don't know. Because that's the Russian pronunciation. Right. <laughs> the, in Ukrainian, is Kiev, right. not Kiev. So <laughs> think about this. They're talking about, oh, yes, Kiev is for Ukrainians, except we're using the Russian language to describe it. It's right. just, it's so absurd. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, so moving on to some more recent events, such as Sudan, what, what's, why, why Sudan? Why now? I mean, it's clear that the U.S. probably has a hand in this. This is probably another sort of proxy war that the U.S. has initiated. But why, why Sudan? What, what's the significance but yeah, Sudan. It's it's fascinating in terms of what we're what we're learning now. I hadn't really paid much attention to it prior to this. Mm -hmm. I just you know assumed it was one more uh, African hellhole with uh, death and destruction and you know terrible food. But uh, it turns out that the United States Embassy had seventy personnel there. Well, that's almost as many people at that embassy in Khartoum as are at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev. Now, why is that? Well, Sudan is not that large. It's, it's a geographically a large country, but it is not a geopolitically uh, very important place. It doesn't do extensive trade with the United States. Uh, what was going on is Sudan was being used in part by the United States through the Central Intelligence Agency as a logistics base to support the government of Yemen in its war against the Houthi rebels. Because remember, the Houthis were backed by the Iranians. So yeah. this was this is one other component of U.S. policy to try to quell and weaken Iran from a general uh, strategic standpoint. Yeah. But you've had you've had talks underway between Russia and the government of Sudan for you know more than two years, going back three years, about Russia getting to build a naval base on the Red Sea in uh, Sudan. And the Sudanese government had agreed to that, and that had started moving forward, it appears, in the, in the last couple of months. Now, in this, the Russians also dealt with one of the leaders of the uh, RSF, the Rapid Security Force, that has uh, been described as a paramilitary organization akin to the Wagner Group. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, Russia was not trying to play one side off against the other. The Western media meme that developed over the last couple of weeks is that this was Russia using the RSF to try to oust the current government. And you go, that doesn't make sense. Because Russia has a deal with the current government to build a port on the Red Sea. Right. So why would Russia want to get rid of the current government? Uh, I think a major, uh, you know, I, it's possible that the United States encouraged or the British encouraged the RSF to launch the coup uh, against the Sudanese army, uh, the current government, uh, who came to power through another coup. Uh, but my understanding is that there is longstanding animosity between those two entities. Uh, the RSF had its roots in the Jean Jouy uh, militia and were prominent in the battles in Darfur. And so th this could boil down to just uh, the rival jealousy between the two factions that just got out of control and nobody was in a position to control it. Not the United States, not uh, the Brits, not the Saudis, and, and not Russia. I would note Russia's embassy is still there in place in Khartoum. They, they've not pulled out. Most other uh, Western nations in particular, and some in the Middle East, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, uh, they pulled out. Yeah. But what's, what's, you got to look at this in the broader context of the U.S. policy effort in the Middle East 
has focused two of its priorities were one, defeating, helping the government of Yemen defeat the go- uh, Iran, Iranian forces or the, the proxy forces of the Houthis that are backed by Iran. Mm-hmm. And then in Syria, isolate, get rid of Bashar al-Assad and uh, again, defeat him as a way to weaken Iran. Well, what, what's happened now since March, since the summit between Putin and Xi Jinping, is a, a complete world changed. Uh, the, the world has been literally turned upside down. So China comes out of that, uh, working with uh, the Saudis and the Iranians, brings them together, a rapprochement. And that yeah. rapprochement means that they're going to open diplomatic relations with one another, and more importantly, stop the war in Yemen. Well, the end of that war in Yemen left the CIA operation in shambles, no longer needed to provide all this military equipment. And believe me, if, if go look at the, uh, the public records about U- U.S. military support to foreign countries. Sudan is a, is a non-entity on that, yet it had extensive military equipment. Um, mm-hmm. My suspicion is a lot of that was being provided through CIA and British MI6 channels. It mm-hmm. was, you know, uh, if you will, under the table payments for uh, the support that Sudan was providing. Yeah. So you've got you've got to look at that as as one one element. So right. this is uh, the, the the policy with respect to Syria as well is falling apart. Yeah. Uh, when when that whole war started, uh, it's inspired by the United States, by the British, uh, with the cooperation of the Turks and the Saudis and other Gulf Arabs that were funding it to get rid of Bashar al-Assad. He was kicked out of the Arab League. Uh, United States was providing weapons that were being sent to uh, Islamic extremists that were Mm -hmm. battling the government of Bashar al-Assad. Some of those weapon systems came out of Benghazi, uh, which was one of the other, you know, all this ends up getting tied together. Now what's happened? Russia is, uh, in fact, I think on tomorrow or Wednesday, we'll be hosting a meeting in Moscow of the, uh, the defense chiefs of Syria, Turkey, uh, Iran, uh, and uh, you know, Syria, Turkey, Iran, and there was one other, oh, and the Saudis. Right. So, you know, they're, they're busy putting, <laughs> stopping these wars that have been going on for years. Yeah. So now you've got China and Russia playing peacemaker United States is just livid. How dare they bring peace? Because it's not under our control anymore. And that that's the real message that's taking place. The power of the United States to dictate and control events in the region is weakened dramatically and uh, it may be coming to an end. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it, I mean, the the this war in, in Ukraine, in Sudan, would, so would this be... Uh, the U.S. trying to thwart Russia's attempt at building a naval base is that is that would that be a fair statement? Do you think that's kind of what's happened? Yeah, yeah, that would be uh, there would there would be that element. Both the U.K. and the United States wanting to prevent the Russians from getting that naval base. Yeah, um, but it looks like uh, at this point, the Russians have kept lines of communication open to both the RSF and the government of Sudan. And I think Russia has been very cautious about not taking sides in this conflict, trying to help bring it to an end. Uh, Because I think a lot of this, uh, the Sudanese have been fighting each other for years. Um, And it's a lot of it's tribal in nature. And, and, you know, with a with a undergirding of some uh, Islamic motivation on one side and uh, the local native religions and tribal affairs on the other. So going back to Syria, um, the that small American contingent in on the border with I believe it's on the border with uh, Jordan and possibly Iraq, um, yeah. where from my understanding they're basically stealing oil. They're basically overseeing. They they control the oil rich part of of Syria where they're just extracting the oil and just helping themselves to Syrian oil basically. Um, now I understand they're they've been under attack by Iranian forces or 
forces um, allied to Iranian forces. So right. what's the predicament? I mean, for what, what, what what's going to, what do you think, what options does, does the U S army have here? I mean, they could, they don't, I know from what I understand, they don't have a lot of forces there. So they, are they going to stand and fight or do you think they'll, they'll have, they'll be forced to evacuate? I think ultimately they'll be forced to evacuate. It's an unsustainable position. Yeah. Uh, long logistics line to keep them supported. And, and that oil, the entire purpose of the oil is to supply oil to Israel. That's what's going on. Right. This is this is not oil to be, be sent to, you know, New Orleans, Louisiana, or Miami, Florida, or New York City. This is this is oil for Israel. Yeah. And to uh, try to ensure that Israel can stay afloat. But, yeah. um, you know, U.S. occupation and activity in Syria, it's illegal under international law. Yeah. But, you know, it's just one reminder that the United States acts with impunity, regardless of what uh, international law uh, would dictate. Yeah, they want others to abide by international law. <laughs> That's the right. just the hypocrisy is on, is just off the charts. I mean, the rules, they, rules, the rules based international order is the phrase. Right. And well, unstated is it's the, the rules set by the United States. We get the yeah. and we get to decide upon the rules, and we don't even have to print up the rule book. We'll just tell you whether it's right or wrong. Yeah. And you have yeah. to trust us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we don't have to abide by it if we don't want to, but you have to. But right. it's like right. It's like, Oh dear. Um, okay, so I have another question here. It, this is in relation to. Um, uh, so, yeah, what are your thoughts on the FBI's recent discovery of a secret Chinese police station in New York City? Um, do Do you know anything about this? Is this Is this true, or is it just a rumor? Is it? Well, I, I know what the Chinese say. I know what the United States says, and perhaps the truth is somewhere. Uh, in the middle, uh, for the Chinese standpoint, it, it, that that was uh, an official government entity designed to help Chinese citizens with uh, in legal difficulties or navigate uh, problems here in the United States. From the U.S. standpoint, it was an intimidation element of China. the uh, The reason that the United States comes out with this statement now is because we're pushing back against China. Uh, you know, China's the new enemy. Yeah. Uh, Russia's an enemy. China's an enemy. Iran's an enemy. Uh, the United States is not busy about making friends. It's uh, just keen upon trying to punish enemies. And this is one way where we can, quote, punish China. It, it, but what we're really doing is just irritating the hell out of China. Yeah. Uh, as, as opposed to, you know, hampering any of their actual capabilities. Yeah. So talking, speaking of China, um, are we likely to see a hot war between <clears throat> the United States and China over, over, of course, you know, Taiwan? Is are things going to heat, or do you think that level heads will prevail and they'll defuse the situation, or or is Amer or the American leadership just hell bent on war with China and they're they're going to do whatever it takes to get China to fire the first shot because that seems to be the 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 way the American Americans do things. They get the they they back the en their enemies into a yeah. corner and make them take the first shot, and then they can justify going to war. I mean, that seems to be how they do it. Oh, I, w I wish I had those powerful predictive capabilities. Otherwise, I would have picked the, you know, I've been, been king in Vegas in terms of picking <laughs> the winners and walking away with tons of cash. Uh, the the from a rhetoric standpoint, it would appear that Russia uh, that the, the Chinese. And, and the Americans are on a collision course. Yeah. Uh, China has, in the wake of the Russian special military operation, come to the realization that the United States is, in, is intent on doing to China what it has tried to do to Russia. Yeah. And so the Chinese are taking appropriate steps to try to counter that and to prepare for that. So one of the things they've done is with that Xi uh, Putin summit, is they've reached a variety of agreements, agreements, uh, political agreements, diplomatic agreements, economic agreements, and most importantly, military agreements. Mm -hmm. One of which I would uh, venture to say is Russian assurances to provide China 
with hypersonic missiles that it will be able to use and deploy against possible U.S. Uh, military forces, naval forces in particular. Yeah. So China is taking all necessary steps to prepare for a military confrontation, but it is working to avoid that and taking the opposite, sort of a, a lower key approach with Russia and trying to isolate the United States diplomatically around the world. And that policy appears to be working and working very effectively and quickly. So part of that involves one creating an alternative to the US dollar, produce de-dollarization, weaken the United States economically. Uh, that's why uh, China has signed a deal with uh, Brazil, that Brazil and China will deal with US dollars. Uh, same with Indonesia uh, is happening. Same with India. So this de-dollarization started. Uh, that's one aspect. The other aspect is China's diplomatic efforts in Africa, mm -hmm. along with Russia, to try to break away some of these countries, which are, frankly, critical suppliers of some minerals like lithium uh, that are essential for this madness of the rush to green energy uh, and electric vehicles in the United States and Great Britain. So they can sort of you know, starve the West in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, China will only engage militarily with the West as the last resort or if attacked. And I cannot discount the possibility of the United States making uh, gro gro you know, a very grave miscalculation yeah. in uh, running uh, a battle group or something through the Taiwan Straits or um, making some show of support, sending military equipment to Taiwan that will elicit a Chinese response. In any event, China holds a lot more cards over the United States than vice versa. Yeah. Especially on, it's, I mean, again, it's on China's doorstep. I mean, it's one thing to engage an enemy somewhere <clears throat> on, on a somewhat neutral ground, far, far from their own territory. But, I mean, Taiwan is right there. It's right in China's doorstep. Yeah. The, the United States has to cross the entire Pacific. Okay, they have the world's most powerful navy. But even so, like you said, these these hypersonic missiles pose a real danger to to their ships. And so would you say well, that? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, describing the United States as the most powerful Navy, it's like saying, we've got the biggest, strongest guy who carries a sword and we're going to send him out at you, except you're standing over there with a, with a machine gun. Right. So I don't care how big and strong the guy is and how great he is with the sword. He's not going to beat the machine gun. And that's what the United States Navy is the equivalent of some big swarthy guy with a sword yeah. out going up against countries with machine guns. And, you know, the, uh, the United States has yet to change tactics or come to the realization that our entire military, you know, one of the, the pillars of our uh, stri military strategy is completely collapsed now. It, it's an it's a expensive white elephant. Yeah, uh, looks good. At one point, was uh, wonderful for projecting power, but in very you know fewer places that it can go in the world now make a difference. So it's it's out of date. Would you say it's it's they've kind of failed to keep up with the times and yeah yeah. So it it's like for... it's becoming like the you know the fact the horse cavalry still existed as a unit within the U.S. Army up until the start of World War II. Think about that. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, the, uh, having horses charging uh, entrenched troops in battle was a Civil War thing. And it still took another 80 years to get rid of that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So are there enough level heads? The question is, are there enough level heads in D.C. or the Pentagon, should I say, to <laughs> avert? such a uh, a collision with china because surely these people know that i mean they they must know that the the u.s navy can't can't stand will suffer tremendous losses if they try and take on china on on china's doorstep i mean yeah. 
what, what is their plan? Do they have some something? I mean, maybe they have a secret weapon that we don't know about. <clears throat> I, mean, I don't know there's obviously nukes, but that would be suicidal. But yeah, what what are they? Are they just throwing stuff at the wall and hoping it'll enough will stick? Or what's what's their plan? What's their what are they thinking? Well, there is no plan, and there is limited thinking. Uh, yeah. the, the short answer to your question is no. There are no level heads. Okay. Uh, or the level heads that exist are not in positions of power. And anybody that tries to make the rational argument uh, is going to be shut out, shut us, you know, shunted aside, yeah. or even fired. Um, the one I, what, what, I, what strikes me is the depth of the propaganda and the Western side. So we ignore the fact that, you know, 51 years ago, Richard Nixon went to China and established the one China policy with the Chinese, in which we essentially conceded that Taiwan was part of China. So the United States stopped treating Taiwan as a separate country independent of China. Yeah. But we still maintained a little bit of the fiction that somehow they were sort of independent, but we still didn't treat them as such. They didn't get to have diplomatic representation. They didn't get to open an embassy. Their ambassador was not accepted in the United States. But now over the course of really this last five years, six years, uh, the United States, the, the average person in the United States has completely forgotten or not paid attention to what was the one China policy. And are re we're treating Taiwan now as if it is an independent country. And every step we take in that regard is further alienating and enraging the Chinese. Yeah. The, uh, and at the same time, any American politician right now that tries to argue that China has a claim on Taiwan in the same way that the United States has a claim on Hawaii, you'd be attacked as a Chinese stooge, as is a tool of the Communist Party of China. Yeah. So there, there is no, there's not even a platform or a foundation for having any kind of meaningful discussion, intelligent discussion on this mm -hmm. to try to get cooler heads to prevail. So the I, Americans are going to continue to embrace this delusion until events unfold that we will try to do something to hang on to Taiwan and we'll destroy ourselves in the process. So if that's the case, why does the why does the United States not change their policy and say, okay, we now recognize Taiwan? I mean, why do they keep this one China policy if it's so contradictory to how <clears throat> they how they um, conduct their foreign policy? Um, it is um, it, it certainly is a situation of dissonance where um, you're holding two contradictory positions yeah. by its actions, though, actions and rhetoric. The United States is treating Taiwan as an independent country. Yeah. And that's what has infuriated the Chinese. Uh, there is no nobody that I've heard of, of any prominence in the United States has stepped up, said, no, wait a second. We this one China policy does this, recognize that Taiwan is China is part of the People's Republic of China? Yeah, uh, the United States has always tried to pretend. Well, we didn't really mean that, but we do. And um, it, you know, we, we just we've held two sort of irreconcilable positions, and so it's it's going to come back to bite us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how are we doing for time? Are we? Uh, are we uh, we go about another 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I want to talk about Europe. Um, so, Germany, do, do you think Germany will, do you think there's anyone there? Do you think they have the, the capacity to uh, remove themselves from under the, the boot of, of, of Washington? Because r really they, they're on, they're on a collision course with, with complete, um, disaster for their industry, yeah. um, you know, with obviously with Nord Stream and anything and everything. They, they, the way I see it, Germany has two choices. They can either keep going 
on the American side and lose their basically lose their industry. I, I don't I don't see how they're going to remain, how they can keep their industry going without uh, the fuel they need, or at least the affordable fuel, should we say, um, or have some kind of revolution and and side with Russia, go back to the because they have to choose one side really. They and but could could they? Is it possible? Could they? Could they do that if they, if there was a enough will in, in the population and the and they got rid of the current political leadership because that would need to be done. The political class yeah. now in Germany is completely pro Western, anti Russian. Um, say they managed to do that, would they? Um, I mean, what could the U.S. do? I mean, could the U.S. stop Germany from essentially defecting to to the Russian side? Is that well, no. I think again, U.S. influence and control over Germany is uh, is ebbing. That the problem is not just Germany. It really is. It's pervasive throughout Europe and then the yeah. U.K. Is this uh, fanatical embrace of the climate change agenda? Yeah. It is. It, it's like a religion. Yeah. The fervor and, and frankly, the nonsense that's embraced, the contradictions. Um, so uh, Germany has embarked on this fanciful quest to be green energy, no nuclear power plants, no coal fired, no natural gas, just sun and wind. Woohoo. Well, they don't have and cannot produce enough energy to do that and sustain industry yeah. and uh you know apparently these uh, these the green party in germany they must go into hibernation sometime in october and not wake up until march because they don't realize that once you get into late fall and all winter it's dark most of the time you don't have sunlight you're not in a position to do anything from a solar power standpoint so yeah. enough with the nonsense but Anybody that tries to raise that as a valid point is shouted down as climate denier. You know, it's like I, I think the, in, the entire language is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Climate change. Oh, as opposed to climate stasis where yeah, yeah. nothing ever changes. Please. You know, yeah. we went from global warming to global cooling to, well, the, the climate changes. Duh. The question is. How much of that climate change is caused by actual human activity? And if you say, well, most of it's caused by human activity, therefore the solution is get rid of humans. <laughs> that's, that's where the logic goes. And that's what they're doing in Germany. Yeah. They, are, they are disarming themselves. They're, they're eliminating industries. They are closing down factories. And with those go away jobs. And as those jobs go away, go, go away hope. Go away the economy. You know, I've I've lived through uh, in my I grew up in a place in, in the United States called Independence, Missouri, the home of Harry S. Truman, the president, mm -hmm. and actually went to middle school across the street from uh, Harry Truman's home. I have living memory of seeing him walking the street. So he was still alive when I was a, a 13 year old, 14 year old. But in, in my town back then. We had two General Motors automobile factories, one called Leeds, one called Fairfax. And uh, they provided great jobs for people that only had a high school education, um, but they could comfortably be in the middle class. Their families could have a new car every year or two. They could take vacations. They weren't wealthy, but it was a solid job with the future. You're actually making something. There was uh, Alice Chalmers, a farm, uh, it made farm equipment, tractors, harvesters. Uh, Bendix Corporation made components for the aviation industry. Uh, Sheffield Steel, Armco Steel, uh, steel plant, obviously. And then uh, Standard Oil. Those are all gone. Those are all gone now in, the, in my, uh, my old uh, uh, city. And that city is dying. It is dying because there is not an economic base, because without those factories, then there were not the, the workers, at least if they had those factories, then they'd go out to stores and they'd, they'd buy furniture and they'd buy uh, uh, 
uh, new homes and they'd buy air conditioners. And, you know, it ends up sparking a consumer uh, ability to purchase items that then create secondary, tertiary businesses that also thrive. Well, once those main jobs go away, it starts contracting. That's yeah. exactly what's happening in the UK. It's yeah. happening in Germany. And look at the number of pu- the number of pubs that have closed in the UK. Closing a pub in the UK. Yeah. What? My God, that's that's like that's like yeah. you know raping a nun on the altar. That's a that's sacrilegious. Well, the pub is yeah. is, is the new church is that what replaced the church basically. So yeah. What, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. No. I mean, I, it, and we're talking like pubs. We're talking pubs that survived World War One, World War Two, the Great Depression. Yeah. And yet they're going under now. Yeah. 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 I mean that that frightened. Yeah. People yeah. beyond belief. That's a canary in the mine shaft. That's dead. Yeah. Yeah. Where I I mean I live in the north of England and I live in an old mining town. And it was a thriving industry until about 40, 50, well, actually the last mines closed maybe 25 years ago, but it was, um, yeah, it was coal mining and um, they used, and pottery. That was the main industry here, but it was absolutely thriving um, up until a few decades ago. And now it's, you, you know, you see the old mine shafts, the old collieries, and it's just a, um, a, it's just a relic of what it used to be. And that's, I mean, all over Northern England, I mean, England deindustrialized itself yeah. over the last 50 years i mean they they did it to themselves but um yeah and it's just it's become it's like it's exactly like the u.s i mean it's it's become uh they're not they're not a manufacturing economy anymore they're a consumer service-based economy and i guess that was trends i mean it was possible to maintain with I, I, if i'm not mistaken the sort of global influence that they that the Anglo-American sort of empire, I guess you could say the neo empire that they, that they had um, was able to sustain such, you know, that that's how they were able to, to not com- completely um, collapse without industry. But mm-hmm. now where they're losing their position as a global hegemon, um, that that's really going to cause some serious um implications that's gonna have serious implications on on the economy so yeah i i I don't know what's gonna happen but it's um yeah that's that's where we are so um but yeah it's the same here that they're like you said they're they're obsessed with climate change the new green this whole green movement and and climate change i mean yeah there's no there's no sun here i mean (laughs) in the north of england we (laughs) it's like the there's it's it literally rains almost every day and there's hardly any sunshine so i i don't, I don't know what they're thinking but um yeah it's um it's not it's not a uh sustain it's not sustainable so i mean who knows what the, what they're gonna do um yeah so okay well i guess um I guess we've come to the end. Should we uh, should we wrap it up? Sure, we've uh, we've covered the waterfront. Uh, yeah, you know the, the the one the one thing I will leave your uh, viewers and listeners with is just to recognize mm-hmm. uh, we are we are living through a historic um, moment. Yeah, that will be alter the future of the world. Yeah. Uh, the era in which the United States dominated. This really started at the end of World War II because everybody else was completely exhausted from the war. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's come to an end. Uh, and it's come to an end both because the United States no longer has the economic muscle, uh, industrial base to sustain its military adventures, mm-hmm. coupled with a complete loss of any people of leading uh, the free world, so to speak, with the likes of a demented Joe Biden and his uh, the, the retinue of uh, incompetent children that surround him. Uh, the United States is completely lost. Or instead of diplomacy, we're doing bullying. Yeah. And as, so out of this uh, is emerging uh, the, with Russia and China 
as the leaders in creating this new world. And the fact that they have now formed a de facto union yeah. uh, that is without precedent in history. And never in the history of either country have they come together in such a way. And so this is this is going to be very consequential for Europe, mm -hmm. uh, for the United States. Europe is going to become increasingly irrelevant and an afterthought. Uh, yeah. Its influence, you know, particularly like the British influence, which has dominated the world for the last 500 years, uh, is going to be, uh, you know, it comes to an end. It's a relic. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's it's certainly, a, we're, at a, we're at a transitional phase in history. Um, so, yeah, like you said, historians will refer to this era and um, as a as a very uh, important turn, turning point. So, yeah, well, I guess we can wait and see what happens. And uh, yeah, well, let's hope that some level heads prevail in uh, in Washington, at least see this out peacefully yeah, right, rather than, yeah. than lashing out because the consequences would be unthinkable. So, right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Larry, for, uh, for uh, accepting this uh, interview. It's been uh, been a great pleasure. And um, yeah, I hope to uh, invite you on again if um, if you'd like to. And uh, be happy, happy to chat with you again. Very good. Thanks for having me. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, Larry. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.